Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I'm here today with my awesome pathology resident, Dr. Haluk Kavas. And uh, these are a continuation of the Oregon Pathologist Association cases. Unfortunately, when I gave this lecture in um, uh, August 2021, my video file corrupted, I think, after case six, and the rest of the video did not record. So uh, Haluk has helped me uh, by sitting down with me and, and forcing me to go over these and actually get this recorded so we can release the rest of these cases and answers for the very patient pathologist in Oregon. So in any case, uh, without any further waiting, let's do this one. This is a 75-year-old man with a red-purple cheek nodule. And we've got the digital slide right here. And you can see up here, we've got some spindle cells in the dermis. There's an ulcer that probably was a biopsy site. I can't remember. It's been a long time since I first saw this case. And then down here, it looks different, much more cellular multinodular extending way into the subcutis and big zones of necrosis in the middle lots of necrosis so the uh the spindle cells are kind of a kind of a slightly grayish color or kind of or purple even their cytoplasm kind of amphophilic very atypical hyperchromatic mitotic activity yes yeah, so this is a very high grade aggressive tumor and is going all the way into the skeletal muscle and here is the first thing I want to point out is we can see that the um, in between the tumor cells there are little cracks and spaces and some of those have blood cells in them so when you see spindle cells that are kind of in fascicles with blood filled little spaces one thought that you would have is Kaposi sarcoma so Kaposi sarcoma is, is a consideration. The problem is that this is really ugly and atypical tumor, much more atypical than most cases of Kaposi sarcoma are. And also this was the uh, face of a 75 year old, which would be an extremely unusual uh, um, history for Kaposi sarcoma, which is gonna usually uh, arise either in the setting of uh, AIDS or, yeah, exactly, they're driven by HHV8 and they can arise in patients with AIDS or other immune suppressed conditions or when they arise in elderly patients, usually it's on the feet or the lower legs, not the head and neck. So a su uh, something that looks like Kaposi sarcoma, but is on the sun-damaged head and neck of an old person, to me, that's angiosarcoma until proven otherwise. And that's what's going on here. This is an example of a kind of solid and cellular spindled appearing angiosarcoma. It has kind of spindled and a little bit epithelioid cells also. And it's kind of having a bit of mimicking of Kaposi sarcoma, but the clue is the the location and the age, and then also the, the dramatic atypia. And then when we go here, you can see it's making actually more, more obvious well-formed channels made by the tumor cells. But the best area I'm gonna show you, we're gonna zoom back out and go up to the top. The key, I think, is up here. So a lot of times, uh, this is what you're gonna wanna see in an angiosarcoma, is infiltrating, interconnecting vascular channels that are infiltrating out into the tissue and they're filled with blood. So you can see that th these are actual vessels made by, they're kind of irregular, not well-formed vessels made by malignant endothelial cells. So this is a classic feature of angiosarcoma. And um, I find that, that most of the time, angiosarcomas are, are pretty obvious vascular channel formation, but there are some cases where they can become very solid and hypercellular and not make well-formed channels. So sometimes that's epithelioid angiosarcomas can be very sheet-like and can mimic like a melanoma or a poorly differentiated carcinoma. And then the spindle angiosarcomas like this one can kind of mimic um, Kaposi sarcoma or other sarcomas. So I would say that usually though, if you have a large enough sample, even if you have areas that are very cellular and don't have well-formed vascular channels, if you get a big enough sample, if you look out at the periphery, you'll begin to find areas like this where you see tumor cells actually forming interconnected vascular channels. And so sometimes you do have to look very carefully and I've had ones on small biopsy that had no obvious vascular channel formation or only very focal. And those are treacherous ones because sometimes uh, angiosarcomas, particularly epithelioid angiosarcomas, can be keratin positive. And so they could lead to a misdiagnosis as a poorly differentiated carcinoma. And unfortunately, these are very aggressive tumors and they uh, have some unique management considerations. So the this is a, a good example again of here you can see there's a blood filled spaces and they are lined by atypical cells. So that's a real important thing is when you see blood filled channels and you're thinking, could it be angiosarcoma? Look at the lining cells of the channels. They should be ugly and atypical cells. 
Um, cause you know, otherwise some tumors have a lot of vascularity in the background, but are not truly making vascular channels. So I think that that's a uh, important to, to learn how to go in close and look at the, what lines the spaces and if they're atypical endothelial cells. So angiosarcomas are going to usually stain with, with vascular markers. The, the, the ones that I like the best are ERG, ERG and also CD31. CD34 will stain them oftentimes, but I've seen several CD34 negative angiosarcomas, which is really scary and treacherous pitfall. And then the other thing that I like to point out in this case is that, look, what if you just had a shave biopsy like this deep? It'd be really easy to miss this. So up here, there are atypical cells forming vascular channels, even like an atypical mitosis, it looks like. But the... Um, but they're just very focal. So when I see, if I see endothelial atypia in a shave biopsy on the elderly uh, head and neck of a sun damaged person, I get really worried about that. And, if, and I would ideally like to see a clinical photo. If it's part of a larger bruise-like lesion, a violaceous lesion, then I tell them to go back and get me a bigger sample to rule out angiosarcoma. So I always have a, a real high suspicion for this disease. I I volunteer with an angiosarcoma patient support group on Facebook. And so I've met many patients who have this and their family members. And so I have a, a real heart for, for people who suffer from this terrible disease because of all those, those uh, people that I've met online. And um, uh, so it's a, it's a tumor that's uh, important to me to make other people aware of. And I always think about it very carefully because it's a, such a serious diagnosis. And many cases, unfortunately, do lead to mortality. Although I've met some patients that have been long-term survivors from angiosarcoma, which has really been an amazing thing uh, for me. So let's see, I think the other end out here has some good, see these are vascular channels lined by malignant tumor cells. And then it's right here we even have some perineural, here's a nerve and we got perineural uh, invasion by tumor cells. And sometimes they can really infiltrate way, way, way out beyond the main tumor mass. Like probably right here, actually. Yep. Yeah, see, mm -hmm. there's a little vessel here and a little vessel here lined by eight typical cells. So if you're ever looking at margins on these, on frozen sections, it can be very, very treacherous because you can have such focal, like there. Look at this. This is a malignant, malignant endothelial cells making a vascular channel here. So you can have little tiny vessels way out beyond the main tumor mass, and that can be very uh, difficult. All right. So that's a good example of uh, angiosarcoma that has both spindled and epithelioid areas and kind of an unusual amount of solid cellular uh, stuff. And angiosarcomas usually arise in the skin. Um, it's uncommon to see them as like a large, deep, soft tissue mass. It's been reported, but it's pretty uncommon. I would say the vast majority I've seen are in the skin. Um, with a couple exceptions, sometimes young women get them as a primary tumor in the breast, unrelated to radiation. And then also they can occasionally occur in some internal organs like the right atrium of the heart, and sometimes the liver or the spleen are other sites you can have angiosarcoma. And there are some other odds and ends um, exceptions. So that's angiosarcoma.